Does that work? Sí, está listo, Mauro. Ya yeah, it's working. They're just waiting for the recording button to start. Okay. Mauro, avisate lo de la pantalla que tienen que pinchar ahí para fijarlas. Yes, Dr. Hello, Dr. Duchamp. It's a pleasure to have um, to, to have you with us. Can um, you hear me? Yeah, I could hear you. It's an honor. It's good to be uh, able to talk with you guys. Ahora le, ahora le explico. Can you, can you hear me, Dr. Duchamp? Yeah, I could hear you well. Can you hear me? No sé si me escuchan. ¿Vos, Santi? Yo los oigo perfecto. Ya. Yeah. Doctor Duchamp. Yeah, yes, Mauro, Ma Mauro, Doctor Duchamp was, was just replying to you. I think that you, you can hear him. No, the honor, the honor is our, please. Me. So, I will introduce you just a brief in, okay. in, in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, we can. Perfect. Yes, yes, I, I do. Perfect. Um, lo voy a presentar al doctor Duchamp. El doctor Duchamp, eh, obviamente, es mundialmente conocido por sus invitaciones e investigaciones y expertise en las vías aéreas superiores de los equinos. Se graduó en el año... 1979 de la Universidad de Montreal, para luego realizar su internado y residencia en cirugías en la Universidad de Cornell, donde se diplomó en el Colegio Americano de Cirujanos. Ya en el año 2005 fue elegido presidente de dicho colegio por el término de dos años. En el año 2016 ingresó en el Salón de la Fama de la Universidad de Kentucky Equine Research, y bueno, voy, la apreciación personal que tengo, a mi criterio, es el mejor cirujano de vías aéreas del mundo. No solo por su conocimiento, sino por la humildad que tiene para compartirlo desde siempre ha, ha respondido los emails que uno le manda y las consultas. For this reason, it's an honor to present uh, Dr. Ducharme. Uh, all this, uh, the audience is yours, Dr. Okay, well, thank you very much and welcome. And, yeah. Can you hear I'm, me? I'm you sorry, can go. But if you don't, yeah, I assume you can hear me, but thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I'll start to discuss uh, the pharyngeal instability. And there are three aspects I'd like to cover. Palatal instability, displacement of soft palate, and nasopharyngeal collapse. And you could have, all three of these could be separate or together. You could have pure palatal instability, or you can have palatal instability as a precursor to intermittent displacement of the soft palate. Those two uh, are commonly seen together. So I'll start with palatal instability. So the, the question here is to, or the goal here is to try to separate rostral palatal instability alone from rostral uh, palatal instability that's a precursor to displacement of the soft palate. So the rostral palatal instability is obstructive but it's easy to make this a false diagnosis. And I'll show you a video that ties it as a precursor. In foals, you can make this diagnosis at rest. Uh, horses typically have a history, uh, have a history of uh, making a noise, snoring, foals that is. 
but the all the other horses should be done at exercise that's the only way to get the diagnosis so this is a horse with rostral instability just i'll stop it here so the rostral aspect of the soft palate is billowing going up and down but the caudal aspect is concave so that would be so here it's concave so it's billowing up here but concave there so this looks like palatal instability but notice that the this is the nasal septum the ventral aspect of the nasal septum if the scope is sliding out toward the nose during exercise you'll make this diagnosis a, this is a false diagnosis it's not really instability of the palate it's due to the scope coming in and out of the larynx so i'll run this again so it looks like palatal instability here and then you'll see the nasal septum start to come up there. And so you need to be able to differentiate Russell palatal instability from the scope sliding in and out, which gives you a false diagnosis. So I'll pass this. This is a typical displacer. So the larynx looks good. Then the whole palate become unstable. The epiglottis look flaccid the air epiglottic full here collapse inward a little bit and the horse displace typically swallows to replace it and then replaces it so that would be a typical palatal instability as a precursor to displacement concave soft palate then the whole palate is billowing up and down the epiglottis is uh, getting flaccid it's looking flaccid i'll tell you before later sorry that the epiglottic flaccidity doesn't exist in most horses so this horse has palatal instability as a precursor to displacement of the soft palate and those two are treated differently now there's a lot of causes of dorsal displacement of the soft palate and the goal is to try to identify the causes because typhoid is not the treatment of every displacement of the soft palate you need to identify the causes and these are common causes uh, to look for uh, before you make or to make the diagnosis structural these are uh, associated with granuloma entrapment cysts it could be a motor deficit associate with disease it could be motor deficit associate with fatigue and we think that this is the most common cause uh, the paper that dr circoni and our team uh, worked on i think it was out in january illustrate that so I'll, I'll talk a little bit of this but i think most horses displace their soft palate because they have fatigue of the thyrohyoideus muscle could be sensory deficit there's an ulcer an abscess something in the trachea it could be unrelated to the palate the horse has a cough as a phageal regurgitation that leads to cough this is this one and then most rarely uh, you get high nasal resistance and so to highlight the important, I'll go through each of that, the importance of these differential is a horse with a granuloma or an entrapment does not need a tie forward. It needs a granuloma or the entrapment taking out. A horse with guttural pouch disease does not need tie forward. It needs uh, treatment of the guttural pouch. These horses need tie forward and they're the most or some procedure like that. Ulcers, um, tracheal aspiration, those should be treated. Uh, the cause should be treated. Of course, this is lower airway, uh, and th so that should be treated. And as a vagal reflux, if it can be treated, uh, that will resolve the problem. 
So of all the upper airway disease that we see, dorsal displacement of the soft palate is by far the most common. Uh, it is seen in a high percentage of racehorses, uh, stand-bred and thoroughbred racehorses. It also can be seen in yearling early on, and we're not sure what that means. A lot of yearling may have palate displacement and uh, not be clinically relevant. In sport horses, there are some good papers from these uh, three individuals showing that uh, there's a high prevalence of displacement. So palate displacement may, in, certainly in North America and in Europe, and I assume in Europe uh, and South America as well, is the most common cause of upper airway obstruction. Uh, or abnormality. Another thing to point out is after tieback or laryngoplasty, there's a couple studies that shows that these animals have uh, a prevalence of displacement of the soft palate. Uh, and so these two paper add various prevalence of displacer in their population. And it, so if you do a tie back on a horse, the relevant point here is if you do a tie back on the horse and the horse is not doing well, it may be because your tie back's not working, but it could also be that your tie back's doing well, uh, but most you have one of these problems. If you have perilaryngeal fibrosis, too much scar with the tie back, uh, like I did a tie back this week, and this was the third time we did him. The chance of him getting excessive fibrosis is higher than a normal uh, tie back. Internal branch of uh, nerve damage, that's rare. I, I don't know that that is uh, how often this is relevant. It, it's re described, and I think it's rare. By far, the most common causes why horse after tie back displace is because they aspirate feed. And if you aspirate feed, then you get uh, ventral displacement of the larynx. So the larynx goes from the cephalic position, so rostral position, to lower down the neck, which is referred to as a cervical position. And that predisposes the horse for displacement. So that brings the larynx in a more cervical position, a tie forward, of course, does the exact reverse. So it could be that the larynx is going in a more uh, cervical position because the muscle are fatiguing, the muscle that are keeping the larynx forward, or it could be because the horse is aspirating and some of the feed is, is irritating the larynx so the horse uh, brings his larynx further back. After a tie back, the most common cause of uh, asp displacement is tracheal aspiration. And uh, those that does do the surgery know that the rostral aspect of the esophagus, the wide part, is right over the muscular process. And if there's adhesion or sutures that irritates the uh, esophagus, the horse will cough. Uh, so those would be two reasons why post tie back a horse displaced. So as you're looking at this, you'd want to, at least what I do is I try to A, be convinced whether he's a displacer or not, and B, try to find out the cause because the cause is directly related to the treatment I'll choose. Uh, in term of diagnosis, these are common, at least English terms. Uh, in sport horses, most people complain that the horse makes a noise. In race horses, uh, it's because the horse performance has decreased. And these are, are all English term. But basically, you have a problem in the horse's performance associated with airway obstruction. Now, laryngeal hemiplegia or recurrent laryngeal neuropathy
cause obstruction of airflow during inhalation. Dorsal displacement of soft palate, as you know, cause obstruction of airflow during exhalation. So there are different phase of respiration that's affected. Sound, 72% of horses make a noise, 25% uh, in that study, 25% of the horses that make a gurgling noise were displacer and have something else, which emphasize the need for, if you hear a noise that's gurgling, it doesn't mean that it's displacement only. It could be displacement with other things or other abnormality. And then the other aspect of it is lack of noise does not mean that the horse is not a displacer. Because the horse is quiet, uh, he can still be obstructed. The noise comes from the caudal edge of the soft palate with vibrates up and down uh, during exhalation. So if it vibrates a lot, you hear a noise. If there's no vibration, you hear nothing. And there's, these are just reference of different studies over the year that talked about the uh, silent displacers. Uh, the the other so so you have the history of making a noise that's not sufficient uh, gurgling noise is typical but it's not the only it's only displacer and then you got lack of performance uh, that is uh, present and then we go to the exam the actual exam of the horse and then uh, most of the studies, and this is just a handful of them, it tells you that resting exam is not sufficient uh, or it's not very precise to make the diagnosis. So in, if you can do a treadmill exam, you're always better. Um, but uh, we can't always do a, a dynamic exam, and Santi will tell you that perhaps only 25% of the horse I operate actually have a dynamic exam. So, uh, and the resting exam has a high correlation uh, with false positive and false negative. So you can't say that the horse is healthy and not displacing or is displacing strictly based on uh, the resting exam. Uh, but they are clues, and these are the clues that I look for uh, when I do an endoscopic exam. So uh, when I scope a horse and I see a very flaccid epiglottis, uh, that means that the larynx is in the more cervical position, more down the neck, and that position makes the soft palate unstable. So the, the flaccid epiglottic cartilage does correlate with displacement. Uh, however, it is really rare to have a flaccid epiglottis. It, it's an optical illusion associated with the position of the soft palate. Uh, and I'll go through it later bruises in the nasopharynx. This is a horse uh, 12 hours after a race that has bruising in the nasopharynx. So bruising or chokering are evidence that uh, the horse may have displaced. This is a horse that is a bleeder and you'll see that there'll be blood coming up here. So it's possible to mix up that the horse has bruising of the palate, but that's not what's happening. The horse is bleeding. As you can see, this horse is bleeding during a treadmill exercise, uh, making it look, if you scope him right after, that may be bruised, but it's really just, he's a, he's a bleeder. And you'll see when he swallow, the blood goes away and will eventually come back. But 
Uh, so bruising and bleeding are different, but they may look the same. Uh, and then this horse will start painting again. Uh, so the dynamic exam is the best. Now, I'll stop here. One, the larynx goes from a rostral position to a cervical position. The epiglottis moves upward, making this aeropiglottic full looser. So it's commonly seen with displacer prior to them displacing that they have collapse of the aeropiglottic full medially. Uh, that's common. And if you pay attention to this horse, he also has some laryngeal disease. Look, his vocal cords also collapse. But I'll run this video. And so he's got aeropiglottic full collapse and then eventually displaces. And those two are commonly seen together. And so laryngeal descent is associated with epiglottic flaccidity appearance of, and it's associated with area epiglottic full collapse. There are some other abnormality you can see at exercise that would tell you that something else happening in the displacement and making you think of a cause. This is a horse, this is the same horse, a two year old trotter harness horse that has an intermittent entrapment. When he entrapped his epiglottis, he also displays. So typically, and this is a more pronounced case, if you have epiglottic entrapment, you see the shape of the epiglottis under the palate. That tells you the cause. And so if you can relieve the entrapment, the displacement may go away. The other thing to pay attention in the uh, exam is, uh, and I'll stop this horse, is, is the horse displacing first or after a collapse? So horses with laryngeal uh, collapse become hypoxemic. Because of the hypoxemia, the muscle fatigue and the horse can displace. But the primary cause is the uh, recurrent laryngeal neuropathy. Other horses have both problem, and this horse is one that has both. You could see that he displaces soft palate prior to laryngeal collapse, and I'll run him again. So his larynx isn't quite right, but it's still obstructed, and he's got some aeropiglottic full collapse. He's displacing, and then eventually his larynx is collapsing. So this horse need to have both treatment, both to the laryngeal problem and the soft palate problem. As if he only displays at the end of exercise after his laryngeal collapse, then he only needs the laryngeal treatment. Uh, looking, so, so I look at the, I get the history of the horses I examine the horse. If I could get a dynamic exam, I try to look at those subtle differences. And then I'm looking for the cause at rest. And Sandy will tell you how many epiglottis he's raised in his uh, young life uh, with us. And what we're doing is we're looking for some structural abnormality. Uh, so these are three different horses that have displacement problem. So this one has an ulcer and a soft palate. And uh, Santi will tell you, I'll still lift the epiglottis because this horse has a displacement of a soft palate. So he's probably, uh, this palate, the palate ulcer is associated with displacement, but he also has an ulcer and a subepiglottic tissue. And this horse has an intermittent entrapment and this ulcer and this ulcer are contacting. Um, so that tells me that if I only treat the soft palate, I may not be treating the cause or both problem. And this is a horse with a displacement that has a sub epiglottic lesion or ulcer. So if you take care of this sub epiglottic lesion, the displacement should resolve. The horse does not need a typhoid or myectomy he needs to treat 
the source of pain. This is a horse that has an epiglottic abscess, and I'll show you that after. So the abscess may make it hard for the soft palate to fit underneath the soft palate or may be painful and causing displacement of the soft palate. And you notice this horse also has a chondritis here or a lesion there. Any horse that has a chondritis, you should look under their epiglottis because they can have an ulcer and when they're swallowed, that subepiglottic lesion is what's irritating the uh, arytenoid cartilage. This is a horse that had an infection of the cartilage, like this horse has an in, acute epiglottic chondritis, and the infection has damaged the, when the, if the infection damaged the epiglottis, then it'll end up like this, and it's hard for the soft palate to sit there, and these are the most difficult to treat. This is another displacer that when you scope them, you could see that there's something happening under the epiglottis. There's redundant membrane, there's an ulcer, uh, and this could be the cause of the displacement. Horses does not need, none of these horse needs tie forward. Well, this one might, but this one does not need a tie forward and needs to treat this infection. This one needs to treat the abscess, and this one needs to treat this area. These are other horses that had displacement of the soft palate. This is a horse was one of the best two-year-old in the country that had an ulcer in the palate. That's all what the vet had seen, which is here. But he has a tremendous subepiglottic lesion. And so the subepiglottic tissues in the oropharynx, horse can eat and get a kernel of corn something that irritates, uh, poke the epiglottis cartilage, cause an infection, and uh, the infection cause an ulcer, that's painful, that cause laryngeal descent and displacement, but the cause, the treatment is to treat the cause, which is get rid of this. Uh, this is a less common cause of that, usually in two-year-olds, uh, subepiglottic cyst makes it hard for the palate to sit there, uh, does not need a tie forward, needs the cyst removed. This horse has a displacement of soft palate that's permanent, but you could see the outline of the epiglottis, which tells me there's an entrapment going on. And this is a, a huge entrapment that the horse had which caused the displacement. So you need to treat this entrapment to resolve uh, the displacement. So I'll run this video. This horse has a malformation here, this membrane, but doesn't cause anything. But the, the history on this horse is he was displacing and he had flaccid epiglottis and You'll see his epiglottis is this, uh, this epiglottis is quite flaccid. This was uh, just turned two. It was in, uh, or was about to turn two, it's in November. And you could see how both flaccid the epiglottis look like and how um, the, and I'll stop it a little further. There's something else wrong with this horse. I'll replay it here. And you'll notice uh, it's coming soon when I retract the larynx and a scope. See, he has swelling on either side of the palate. This is what's lifting this membrane, making it look flaccid. But this cartilage is not flaccid. It's a fairly normal cartilage. You can see his epiglottic cartilage. It's not flaccid, so it, it cannot be that it is flaccid 
when you look through the nose, but the cartilage is quite stiff. Uh, right? So flaccid, this is the same horse. Flaccid epiglottis is an optical illusion and not all horses, but probably 99% of horses. And, but it tells me that something is pushing the palate up toward the epiglottis. And that something could be because the larynx is descending in a cervical position, or uh, I'll stop this horse. Look how large his uh, tonsils are and his oropharynx. He has severe inflammation. This is another horse looking orally. That's what a normal uh, horse should look like. So no enlargement to the, to the, sorry, the video is not playing well here. So the tonsil are not large at all, but they're quite large on this horse. Yet, you would have thought that this horse has flaccid epiglottis. Um, again, it's optical illusion associate in this horse with enlarged uh, pharyngeal tissue or uh, tonsil in the pharynx, making it look very flaccid because it lifts the epiglottis edge and rolls the mucosal membrane but look how stiff the epiglottis is. So if I see soft epiglottis or flaccid epiglottis, I tell, I'm thinking this horse is predisposed to displacing, but I wanna find out the cause if I can. Now there are some motor deficit. The first group of horse I talked about were horses that were displacing because of structural abnormality. So they need their structural deficit to be resolved. Now this is the most rare, it is when they get inflammation of the pharyngeal branch of the vagus that run again, the rectus capitis muscle and the medial compartment, this nerve here. So you could see the nerve here. If the lymph nodes enlarge, and this is a strangle horse, this one's not a strangle horse, uh, this horse also enlarged lymph node. And you can see the, I'll play it back here. See the pharyngeal branch of the vagal is going near the nerve. That affects the motor nerve. So the motor function of the palate is not right. And uh, that will cause a displacement. So you may I don't scope all the guttural pouch of displacer, only if they have some discharge or other enlarged lymph node. But this is a rare, but it's not zero cause of displacement. And this is the study we just published. Uh, that was the earlier data in 2013. We noticed this. So we had horses that were displacer and control horses that we were exercise at exer exercising on a treadmill at 50, 80, 90, 100% of heart rate max, and then we'd record when they displace. And this is the exercise intensity, the mean electrical activity of the thyrohyoideus muscle while the horse was exercising. And so, the control horses, the faster they go, the harder they work, the more these muscles contract. The displacer, they worked a certain level, then the muscle fatigue, and then the horse displace. So, and this, uh, this is published now, I think it went out in January, but we were trying to figure out why do displacer have muscle fatigue. The muscle is normal on histopathology. Uh, what's happening is there's a proportion of fiber type one and fiber type two. In the larynx, the CAD, which most people uh, you would know, is about 50-50 proportion of fast muscle and slow twitch muscle. The muscle that's keep the larynx 
forward, the thyrohyoiditis, as well as there's other hyoid muscle that do that. However, are fast muscle. They have nearly 70% of the fibers, 75% are fast and a quarter are slow. These are the muscle fiber that cause, uh, that prevent fatigue. So they provide fatigue resistance. And the displacer have a smaller proportion of fiber type one. So they ha it's a fast muscle. So it's like taking a sprinter's muscle and asking them to be marathon. Uh, they have a high proportion of fiber type 2A and a small proportion of fiber type 1. Uh, so the sprinter do really fast, but for only a short period of time. So the, the difference in the displacer is they have a small proportion of fiber type 1 and, a, and they're smaller. So the fiber, there are less of them and they're smaller. So they fatigue earlier. And we think this is what most, the problem with most displacer, at least in racehorses. Uh, so I'll focus more on the thoroughbred. This is the relative frequency and percentage. And this is mean fiber diameter of fiber type one. And you could see that the uh, in control horse, the, the fiber type one uh, is there's our larger size, which is similar to here. Now in standard bread, the fiber type is the same side. Those are trotters. However, the fiber type two are larger. These are displacer or horse we think are displacer. And the larger the fiber type two is, the less it's, the diffusion of oxygen happen with fiber two. So fiber one size, the larger they are, the more fatigue resistance. Fiber type two A, the larger they are, the less efficient they are. So there's a breed difference between thoroughbred and standard bred, but the muscle fiber types are different. And so, uh, and this is the, why we think most horse are displacing and the research we're working on is trying to, or, uh, uh, trying to develop a protocol so we can train the upper airway of the horses to be more fatigue resistant, to shift them. Uh, we can shift them using a pacemaker but that's not a practical solution. So now we're, we've been looking for training. Uh, next cause of displacer. So the first one were structural. The second one was motor deficit associated with uh, disease of the uh, guttural pouch against the pharyngeal branch of the vagus. The third is muscle fatigue. The fourth is sensory deficit. So there are different nerves that provide sensory innervation to the upper airway of the horse. The cranial laryngeal nerve, the internal branch of them uh, in the larynx, uh, vagal glossopharyngeal gives you the nasopharynx and trigeminal give you the nasal. So horses, this is a horse that ship uh, for, uh, for displacement and he has an ulcer. This is the oral view. You can see the soft palate is resting right against the ulcer. So the muscle is not fatiguing. It's just painful. This is another horse. I'll stop him. I'll tell you a story. So this horse was uh, presented to me in January. Uh, he had been, he's been displacing uh, in the fall had had two throat surgery to treat the displacement and it has not worked. And the horse was permanently displaced and nobody had seen the epiglottis in three months. Santi knows this well because we put local anesthetic on many of the horse. So I'll, 
I'll stop this one. I'll just replay this one. So I'm just putting local anesthetic because I'm going to try to bring an instrument uh, to the to undo the displacement and look at the epiglottis. So we're just dripping local anesthetic. And this is the horse. So this is the first time that we're, someone has seen the epiglottis in three months uh, because the horse is displaced, but the horse is displaced because of a painful condition. When we put local on it, I could see the epiglottis. And so we did a esophageal ultrasound on it. I don't know if this, whoops. And that told me there's an abscess into it. And, uh, and we drained the abscess. Uh, this was done, I forget when this was done, 2000, so seven years ago. You'll see the pus comes out. Uh, so it's the pain of the abscess that caused the displacement. Did not need a myectomy, did not need a tie forward. It needed to have someone drain the abscess. Uh, and the way I did it here, that's not, uh, that's a mistake. I don't do this anymore this way. Uh, I think we had one, I don't know if it was with you, Santi, the last one we did. What we tried to do is bring the scissor into the abscess and open it up to allow it to drain, not to cut the cartilage, because the abscess is between two sheets of cartilage. And if you cut one sheet, then the epiglottis may fall at that location. So you need to drain the abscess, but instead of cutting the cartilage, you just make this hole bigger. This is another horse, same thing, had been displaced for a long time, nobody had seen it. We're putting local, this is live, and, uh, and it takes a few seconds. I put a lot of local, maybe 60 to 120 cc, and see he's not displaced anymore. This horse is displacing because he has a bad ulcer underneath the epiglottis. So if you can identify the cause, this horse needs throat spray. I use a lot of aloe vera juice orally to try to resolve that. Uh, but find the sensory cause if there is one. And uh, next I'm gonna focus on nasopharyngeal collapse. Those are uh, less common, but we do see them. Uh, that the thoroughbred racehorses do have them. Uh, this is one study in Japan that's 14%. That's high for me. I, I would say it's closer to 2%. Uh, in the draft, and the, sorry, in the sport horse, it's associated with uh, flexion of the head. And I, uh, I don't know if the Pasofinos that you folks have have that problem more often than us uh, that we see. But the more flexed the horse is, the smaller the diameter of the larynx is. You, you all know that, that if you flex the head, this height is lower than if you extend the head. And if the tone of the muscle here is less, and the tone of the muscle could be less because there's a sensory deficit, the horse does not sense that there's negative pressure, so it doesn't trigger a muscular response or the muscle response is abnormal. Uh, there'd be a few of those uh, causes. It could also be due that the guttural pouch has too much air in there and uh, we need to fenestrate the nasopharynx like uh, one of the horse we did this week. So the diameter of the nasopharynx, the smaller it is, the higher the resistance is. And if on top of that, you add uh, negative pressure or loss of, of uh, sensation, motor or uh, sensory, uh, then you'll, you'll, you'll be prone to collapse. So this horse has nasopharyngeal collapse uh, and it's, more the roof that is collapsing. And so uh, this type of horse, I'll try to catch him on a, where the roof only is collapsing, 
either has inflammation of the motor or sensory nerve, or it has uh, a problem with uh, like a subclinical guttural pouch tympany, in which case the treatment is to fenestrate the nasopharynx. So this is a problem of the nasopharynx that is related to the nasopharynx. Uh, this is another uh, problem. This horse had an abscess around the stylohyoid bone that fractures. So this is a CT scan. So the horse on his uh, back, but this is an, the abscess near the stylohyoid bone that obstructs the nasopharynx. That's a fixed obstruction. Uh, some horse have fracture of the stylohyoid bone that's usually at this level, and that'll cause a fixed obstruction. So it could be fixed or dynamic. I, I showed you first the roof of the nasopharynx that went down, and uh, this one is a fix. And, and then you have horses that the entire nasopharynx is collapsing. Uh, so they look like that. This can be also a problem of motor nerve or sensory nerve. Um, but we're also wondering if in some horses, the, the, this area is too narrow. So we have taken the serratohyoid bone on some of the horses to widen the nasopharynx. If you take the serratohyoid bone out, the stylohyoid bone on this side is no longer brought medially, so it can move laterally. And this is another type of disease that we don't know what causes that. At least I don't know what causes that. There's a couple things odd about, uh, we've described that as VMAD or ventromedial deviation of the apex of the arachnoid. So this horse has that. It's got airy epiglottic full collapse, but it has some the stylohyoids against it. So is there part of the either stylohyoid or sorry, thyrohyoidus bone or stylohyoid bone that is collapsing? And then so many of these horses have the tip of the epiglottis that's deviated laterally, left or right. So I don't have a great treatment for that. Some of these horses have done a unilateral myectomy to encase the strap muscle on this side is pulling too hard. I have removed the serratohyoid bone. Uh, of course, you can trim the airy uh, epiglottic fold. And uh, there's one horse, uh, one or two horse, I think it was with you, Santi. Ricky was his name. We trim the cartilage itself. This is the one I understand the least what's going on, and, and my treatment are are uh, probably the worst. And this this last horse has the entire nasopharynx that's collapsing because he has a problem with his nasal septum. So this was a thoroughbred racehorse that a two-year-old that couldn't train. Uh, and so it's associated with high nasal resistance. And uh, this horse, we took his nasal septum out, and he won his first race. That was a filly. Uh, so it, it can be that the nasal resistance is too high, affecting the nasopharynx. And so some of the horses uh, with that, uh, and we did one this week, will remove the alar folds. Uh, bilaterally to try to decrease nasal resistance. This is uh, another horse that this horse, I'm going to use this horse to emphasize that the position of the larynx in its nasopharynx in, uh, influences function. So this was a standard bred racehorse, Trotter, that uh, was displacing his soft palate. We uh, brought him to the treadmill exam, 
confirm the diagnosis of displacement of the soft palate and did a tie forward. So move his larynx in a more cephalic position. And 30 days, maybe five weeks after surgery, this is him on the treadmill again. So laryngeal function looks okay. Uh, epiglottis looks okay. And as he gets going, his nasopharynx is collapsing. And then you'll see both arachnoid cartilage will collapse inward. And so he gets a very small airway uh, present. And so this horse was normal uh, five, six weeks prior to surgery. So I created that by doing the tie forward. And then I undid the tie forward, went back and race. Uh, it was more forward, but not as forward. But it comes back to this position. So some horse that have narrow mandible, there's something in the position of the hyoid that cause the larynx is supported. Uh, you know, the larynx would live right here. And so maybe compress because the hyoid gets compressed uh, into between the two mandibles. So they, there's some positional effect of the larynx that when the larynx goes to cervical, it causes displacement. And when it goes to rostral, it can cause collapse on the larynx. And so this was uh, that horse that we talked about. And then the last cause of displacement that I see, and this is, this is rare. This is a horse that has esophageal reflux, mainly during exercise. And when he reflux during exercise, saliva falls in his epiglottis, go down his larynx. And then he gets enough saliva that he, that he swallows and cough and displays his palate. So, and I've only seen this uh, a few times, maybe three, four times, could only diagnose it at exercise, no reflux at rest, uh, at least during the few minutes that I scoped them. So tracheal contamination can cause uh, coughing and displacement, just like lower airway disease can cause coughing and displacement. So any horse that's a cougher, you should resolve the cough, cough before considering surgery. At least that would be my advice. Uh, and I'll stop there. This is the Cornell hockey team, which I'm hoping that Santi will get to see a game this uh, winter. I'm not sure if he has any. So I'll stop there and I'll, uh, that gives you not quite 10 minutes for a question. I know you have a talk later on as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Duchamp. It was an excellent talk, really uh, excellent. I have a couple of questions for you. Yeah. Uh, that say, uh, in the case of, uh, what do you think, let, let me translate it, uh, of the your opinion of the beetle bridle oh, pro, that proposed the bitless bridle uh, exactly sorry yeah so uh, this was Dr. Cook's uh, hypothesis uh, they are some horses were the sensory something sensory in the mouth affect their position of their tongue uh, so I I think a very small percentage of horse it may make a difference, but I would, in my experience, it's the minority. Uh, from from a lot of treadmill exam where we didn't use to put bits in there and uh, had them displaced, but I think it's uh, I think it's true that it causes sensory. Uh, 
action and actually the action of the driver on the bit makes a difference the what was the name of that paper uh let me see if i could maybe i could google it here uh, uh it was a paper with david priest uh Yeah, this one. So, and this paper here, uh, that we were able to cause uh, displacement. Let me see if I could even Google it, uh, Priest. Uh, Not sure if it's him. Uh, no, wrong horse. Uh, no. We don't have it, but there, there's certainly in this paper, some horse would only displace when the, we correlated the uh, the video of the race uh, with the endoscopy, and some horse would only displace when the driver grabbed the rein of the horse. Uh, so actually, I may have that presentation. Uh, well. Let me see here. Mauro, ¿estás? Sí, sí. ¿Se le cortó? Se congeló, me parece. Deme, le escribo al doctor Rusha, a ver si nos escucha. Sí, sí, por bien. Ok. Ahí está, él está conectado. Ahí está, ahí entró. Ah, no, ahí abandonó. Ahí salió, che, se salió. Está bien, por ahí se le bloqueó. Esperemos a ver si me, me pide entrar de nuevo. Que le avise Santiago. Mauro. Sí. Eh, Pepe Verocay. Ah, Pepe. Si, si podés, pregúntale eh, qué piensa de atar la lengua como preventivo, que se hace por todos lados, acá sabemos que lo hacemos, eh, cuando es sospecha o prevención, cuando no tenemos diagnóstico real, eh, en videoendoscopía dinámica eh, de que realmente luce okay. ¿qué pasaría con un caballo que no tiene problemas y le atan la lengua? Ya volvió. Yo tengo mi okay. Okay. ahí está conectado otra okay. vez doctor, back, doctor Duchamp Hi, sorry, I don't know what happened uh... yeah, you're back no, no problem. So I, I have a couple of more questions, Doctor. 
In the case that you operate tie forward because you decided it was a private treatment, with um, which was your success rate? Well, if I only operate horses that I that I've uh, that I think as the muscle fatigue theory and uh, the success that we've had published, and I haven't we haven't studied it since. I've been in the seventy to eighty percent. Uh, if they were age horse, three-year-old and older, it's not as good on two-year-old. Okay. Uh, what do you think of tongue tie, even I, for those cases that didn't have a, a definitive diagnosis of dorsal displacement? I think it's, it here, I think it's good. Least, it's here in South America. I think tongue ties are good. I it's think, good. And I think, the... Yeah, I think most horse are better with a tongue tie, but some horse fight the tongue tie. And I've, I've seen horses that we put on the treadmill that only displace when we have a tongue tie. Uh, but I think most of the time, tongue tie is good. Perfect. And this is my question. How do you like to approach the epiglottic, epiglottic entrapment by divi uh, axial division or resection of the tissue underneath? Axial division, uh, I use a guarded hook and scissor. And actually, Santi is writing a paper on this. Okay, so we are waiting for the paper. We haven't. Uh, a good discussion the other day about uh, what was the best and I was trying to because I'm not as experienced as you are and there's a lot of experienced uh, clinicians in South America so we're having a lot of conversations about what people use regard regarding this subject it was quite interesting uh, different approaches that people take um, so yeah yeah it was, it was a good discussion especially for me that to have a broad uh, <laughs> a wider or a broader uh, I don't know, point of view of how people can approach this condition. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, I should tell you that I, I do an axial division and then use a scissor all uh, nasal, uh, nasally and extend that. Uh, and then if it's still in trap, I cut the area epiglottic fold on the left or right side. Uh, you know, not not the standard resection of the membrane, but like you were treating an area epiglottic fold resection. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but it would be best to show with videos. And uh, do, do you find a good correlation between the corner collar and the tie forward? Like a would, test that you can, a corner yeah. collar and the tie forward, do you find a good correlation? Uh, there's a fair correlation. Uh, you know, the problem with the Cornell collar is it has to be placed well every race. Uh, so, you know, sometimes a groom put it well and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's a fair correlation because it's the same principle. You know, how we, how we got to the, uh, tie forward as we were running horses on the treadmill and then at some point for some reason we put our hand on their larynx and able to replace the displacement so then we did uh, we explored the uh, surgery in the collar so they're related but they're not quite the same okay what do you think about the figure eight I think figure eight is very good I think having air in the mouth is bad so our typical, my typical discharge is to uh, put glycerin in the mouth of the horse before exercise and put a figure eight. I don't like air in the mouth because it's air in the underneath in the oropharynx makes the soft palate unstable. Okay. So have you uh, did any treatment for a dynamic collapse? Which one now? Which dynamic collapse? Uh, this is the question. 
Have you done any treatment with dynamic collapse, or laryngeal dynamic collapse? Uh, he will say in the case that, that collapse the vocal cord that lead to a laryngeal dynamic collapse. Oh, laryngeal what, dynamic What is your opinion of ventricular cordectomy? I think it's, I think ventricular cordectomy is good. It improved 30% of airway mechanics. Um, so that may be sufficient depending on what a horse does. And uh, I think the tie back is better in term of airway, but I have more uh, complication. Uh, I think the neurectomy, the nerve transplant and the cordectomy uh, are safer, but the results are not as good in airway uh, size. And right now we're working on a dynamic uh, laryngoprosthesis, which means we put a tie back suture more medially and renovate the lateral belly at the same time. And, okay. uh, but we've only started that in May, and I don't have the experience to say whether it's good or bad. Okay. And here I have the last question uh, from Dr. Masri that she asked me, what is your opinion of the use of Teflon in the tip of the pigotis? Because she has a, a one case that is bended, something like this is what I understand from the question. And uh, that's dorsal displacement. What do you uh, think of? Of Teflon on the epiglottis tip? Exactly. Uh, I've done that in some cases. Uh, it had the problem with the Teflon is well, it's not available in the US anymore, in North America. Uh, it has some risk of it moving in the tissue. And uh, it does help some horses, but not many. I wonder if I would use Noltrex or polyacrylamide instead, or aquamide instead. Uh, that's when the tip of the cartilage is broken or flexible in some reason. Uh, thank you. All right, doctor. Uh, I, will, I want to thank on behalf of all the vets from Latin America. We really appreciate your talk. And thank for Santi that also helped you too, that you are here with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like, okay. wish, thank wish, you, guys. Wish you the best. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bye. I have one last question. India's yeah, so I would like to ask about the... Uh, Yes, I would like. Okay, Dr. Jean, okay, okay. you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Here, yes, uh, Dr. Rohr, thank you for your talk. Uh, I got a lot of from from this. Uh, what do you think about the treatment that Dr. Ordich from Ireland uh, does uh, to prevent the billowing of the anterior aspect of the soft palate? I mean, the firing of the anterior aspect of the soft palate. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the treatment that was uh, started in Australia that were suturing and then the people in the UK and Ireland start burning it. Uh, I don't know, there, the, the, there's problem of damaging uh, muscle with that, but I don't think it's great because you're burning mucosa and uh, and the tissue underneath it, uh, the the result, the published result with that technique is very low, right? It is around 37% with the burning of the palate. Uh, myself, I don't do it, so I shouldn't comment to, but, uh, and I know a few, my friend in the UK and France that use it, uh, they do it because it's popular, but the published results are bad. However, right. uh, can I share my screen quickly? Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. <laughs> no, excuse me, Mauro. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. So there's a, there's a new clinical trial. Oop, are you still there? You can, yeah. Can, it, can you? Now we are sharing. Can you see this? Yes, a second. So yeah, sure. upload it. Can you see this? Can you guys see this? No. Uh, sorry, when I. Uh, Let me change my. Anyway, there's a new I, product called Jennifer. Give us a second. We, we need to change that because we are seeing. Okay. That's done. Okay, I'm sharing. Okay, can you see this? It, yes, it's a paper. See, can you see um, this paper? Not. The paper, yes, right. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so I think that we have a clinical trial on this, and I wonder if that will be better than burning the palate because it'll be on the muscle side. So uh, anyway, th this paper, I don't, uh, I think you're, anyway, that's a, a product to try to stiffen up the palate. I don't know if that's going to work, but I, this makes more sense to me than burning it. But I do not myself have experience burning palate. Okay. Is that an esclerosin agent? No, it's not. It's a cross-linking agent. Ah, okay. It's it's uh, cross-linking of collagen. That oh, these perfect. In, right, sorry. right. And uh, so they've started, and there's a couple group of people looking at this in horses where there's no data, but it makes more sense because the sclerosin product uh, biomechanically have non-lasting effect. You know, the tissue Great. heals and so forth. Great. Uh, so, I, yeah, but I, I don't know. Anyway, that's what's coming on the research. Some people are doing it. Some, some uh, this group is doing it. Okay, anything else? Thank you, Doctor. That's it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Be, we really appreciate it. Thank you. you. Stay safe, all of you. Thanks. Thank you.